Hello everybody and welcome back to another lecture video. In this lecture video we're going to be talking about vector addition using the parallelogram method. So kind of the idea that I have it in brackets parallelogram method will lead you to believe that there is more than one method and as you guys will see there are more than one method to add vectors together but we're going to start off with the parallelogram method. So this is where the real meat of engineering starts is vector addition. It's going to be the first real topic that may puzzle a couple of you students, but don't worry, we're going to go through it together. So with that being said, let's jump into it. So as we kind of mentioned last time, vectors are a little bit different and then they follow specific mathematical principles for multiplication, addition, subtraction, etc. Now, in the last video, we covered multiplication by a scalar. And as we said, it's actually pretty simple. We just scale the vector accordingly and maybe flip the direction if the scalar is negative. Now, when it comes to addition and subtraction, it's actually a little bit harder than multiplication by a scalar because as we mentioned, vectors have direction and this direction must be accounted for. So vector addition, in essence, is going to follow the parallelogram law of addition. And you're saying, Clayton, well, what exactly does this mean? Well, let's say that we have two vectors. We have vector A and we have vector B, and we want to add those bad boys together. So what I want to do is I want to create a vector C, which is vector A plus vector B. Well, what I would do is I would take vector A, place it down, and then I would take vector B and place it on top of vector A. And the resultant vector C is going to be this green vector here. So it's going to start at the tail of A and go to the head of B. Now you guys think, Clayton, you're an idiot. That's not a parallelogram, that's a triangle. You're right. So why is it called the parallelogram method? Well, notice how I started with vector A and then went to B because A, B, C, D, of course I would do it that way. But if we were to start with vector B and place that one down first and then move on to vector A, now you can see that we actually created that parallelogram. So the key takeaway here that I want you guys to know is it does not matter which vector you start with. You can start with A, you can start with B. So start with the vector you guys feel most comfortable with. Now, to actually add these vectors and analyze them, we have two possible methods. The first one is the parallelogram method, which we're going to be covering in this video. And the second one is the Cartesian vector notation method, which we'll be covering in the next video. So the parallelogram method directly involves solving that parallelogram that we created in the previous slide using trigonomic identities. The problem, however, is that if we remember that parallelogram, it wasn't a nice right triangle. We didn't have 90 degrees anywhere. So we have to go to a little bit more complex type of trigonometry, which is the sine law and the cosine law. I say complex, but you guys are very smart kids. You guys are gonna say, Clayton, are you joking? This is simple. It's not complex at all. So let's review what sine law and cosine law are. So if I were to have a triangle, so again, notice that this is not a right triangle. Again, very rarely will you guys see a right triangle using the parallelogram method. And if we have this triangle, we can define each side length. So again, these are the lengths of the sides as capital A, B, and C. So again, these are the side lengths. And inside of that triangle, we have three angles. So we have lowercase a, b, and c, and we call these interior angles. Now note that I put the interior angle small a opposite from side length a. So that's kind of a little fun fact to help you remember where these angles are. Now the first law we're going to talk about is sine law. Now sine law is very great because it relates a side and an interior angle to another side length and another interior angle. So we're going to typically use this if we're solving for another interior angle. In these types of questions where you're given two vectors to add together, well, you have the two vectors. So you know what a, capital A and capital B are going to be. And using some trig, you can find out what maybe small a is. So finding that other interior angle is actually going to be quite easy. Now that's sine law. We also have cosine law. It looks a little bit more gross, but if you look at it intuitively, you'll notice a pattern. So it's not that hard to remember. Now we typically use cosine law to find side lengths. And the key giveaway here is when we look at the equations, we have the side length is equal to something. All right, the side length is equal to something. So typically what we do in these problems is we solve for our resultant force C using cosine law, and then we solve for the angle of C using sine law. And when we go through the procedure, it's going to be very apparent here. So that's kind of the trigonometry that we are going to use in the parallelogram method. 
Now, I may have given you guys the trigonometry, but the method still makes no sense. So let's do a little bit of an example procedure on how exactly we use this method. So let's say that you have a question and the professor says, I give you vectors A and vectors B. I give you an angle vector B makes with the horizon and an angle vector A makes with the horizon. And I want you to add these two together. So this is a very typical uh, assignment or exam type question where they give you two vectors. They give you some uh, geometry of the vectors, so an angle, and they say add them together. Well, the first step that we want to do is we want to create that triangle. Remember, we're going to utilize our trigonomic identity. So we need to create a triangle. So what we're going to do is we're going to take one of the vectors and we are going to place it on top of the other vector. Now, remember what I said, it doesn't matter which one you guys do. So if you guys want, you guys can take B, place it on top of A, or you guys can take A and place it on top of B. For this particular one, I'm going to say, all right, I'm going to take A and I'm going to move it at top of B. So that's the first step. The next thing that we're going to do is we're going to draw our resultant vector to create that triangle. So remember that the resultant vector is going to start at the tail of B and go all the way to the head of A. So in this case, our resultant vector C is going to start at the very left side and it's going to kind of go up to the right side over there. And now if we look, we have a nice triangle. Now this is where the cosine law and sine law are going to come into play because we can start solving for this triangle. So the first thing that we have to do is we have to solve for an interior angle. And you guys are saying, Clayton, well, why do we have to do this? Well, remember that in cosine law, if we're trying to solve for the magnitude of C, we need one of those interior angles. In this case, we need interior angle C, which is going to be over on this side. Remember, the magnitude of A and B is something you're given in the question. So we almost have all the pieces to use cosine law. The last thing that we need is actually going to be that interior angle C. The problem is, is if we look at this, it's not really apparent how we find interior angle C. So how do we find that interior angle C? Well, the best way is to use the fact that we can draw a horizontal line. If we look at this horizontal line, we know that the angle it makes of a half circle is 180 degrees. So if I know the angle on the left side of C as well as the right side, well, then I can figure out what C is. So the question is, what are those angles? Well, if we look at the left side of C, we actually know that that angle is going to be alpha. So now that we know the angle on the left side, we can say, all right, well, I can figure out what C is if I know the angle on the right side. Well, this one's actually even easier because we know that angle is simply going to be beta. We are already given the angle vector A makes with the horizon down below, so we can just kind of copy it to the top now. So remember, alpha and beta are something that we are given initially in the question. So if we want to find interior angle C, all we need to do is go 180 degrees minus alpha minus beta. We have what our C is. Now, since we know what C is, we can actually solve for the magnitude of vector C using cosine law. We have all the pieces we need. Remember, we needed the magnitude of A, the magnitude of B, and that interior angle C. So at this point, we're good to go. We know exactly the magnitude of C. Another thing that we have to do is we have to give some sort of indication of the direction of C. Remember that a vector is a magnitude, which we just solved for, and a direction, but we haven't really specified a direction. If we look initially when we're given vectors A and B, they gave us the angles alpha and beta to define that direction. So we need to figure out an angle to define our resultant vector C. How do we do this? Well, we're gonna to go to sine law and we are going to start solving for interior angles. Now, if I'm looking at C, one interior angle that might be useful is going to be this interior angle A. Now, this is great because we can use sine law because remember, in sine law, if we have a length and an interior angle, we can solve for the interior angle if we know the other length. In this case, we know the magnitude of C as well as interior angle C and the magnitude of A. Therefore, we can easily solve for that interior angle A. So at this point now, we have that light blue interior angle A. Well, from there we can say, all right, if I know what alpha is and I know what A is, well, I can figure out what this angle gamma is, which is the angle that C makes with the horizontal axis. So in this case, I would say that C is maybe 32 degrees with the X axis. So remember when we're specifying the direction of these vectors, we have to give it in terms of an angle. So that's basically the parallelogram method. The problem is, is we have a couple special cases that professors like to kind of throw at you to test your knowledge. And the first one is vector subtraction. So again, we just talked about how we add two vectors together. 
What happens if we want to subtract them? Well, it's actually really simple because subtraction is a special case of addition, just like how division was a special case of multiplication. If I wanted to take vector A and subtract vector B to get my new result in vector C, well, this is the exact same as going A plus negative one times vector b. Now we covered multiplication by a scalar in the previous episode. So we already know that what negative one does is simply flip the direction of the vector. That's all it does. So if I were to take these two and add them together, all I need to do is flip vector b before doing the addition together. So if I have vector a and vector b just like this, and I want to subtract vector b from vector a, well, my methodology would be exactly the same just with that little trick thrown in. So I would place A down, something like this, and if I were to add them together normally, I would place vector B like that. But since I'm subtracting them, what I would do is I would actually flip vector B the other way, and then I can create my result in vector C. And then if we look here, we have our triangle again, we can solve for those interior angles, and we can solve for everything that we need. So again, it's just a special case of addition, all you guys need to do is flip the vector you're subtracting and you're good to go. The last thing that we're going to talk about is the addition of three or more vectors. We just talked about adding two vectors together and adding two vectors, it kind of sucks because we need trigonometry, but you guys are all very smart students, you guys can handle it. When we have three or more vectors, we don't really create a triangle. And you're saying, Clayton, how do we not create a triangle? Well, let's take a peek. So let's say that I had three vectors, A, B, and C, and I want to add all three to get vector D. Well, using the procedure we learned before, we place A down, then we place B down, and then we place C down. Well, we can see that our, our result in vector D is going to look something like this. Well, if you guys are solving it this way, all I can say is good luck, because if we look here, we didn't create a triangle. And if we didn't create a triangle, we can't use sine law or cosine law. So this is not the way that we actually add three plus vectors together. We do something very similar, but basically we split it into steps. So if we add three or more vectors, all we're going to do is we're going to add two vectors at a time to create intermediate vectors, which are then added to the remainder vectors. You're saying, Clayton, that sounds a little crazy. What do you mean? Well, if I was to solve the situation above, I would place A down and then I'd place B down. Now, at this point, I have my two vectors down, so I'm going to solve for an intermediate vector, which I'm going to call R1, which is A plus B. After that, I'm going to take that intermediate vector, and I'm going to add the remainder vector. So in this case, I've already added A and B together, but I still have C left. So I'm going to place C now on top of R1, and then this will give me my result in vector D. So it's just a matter of splitting it into steps, and from here, I can solve for our result in vector D. And that's it. That is vector addition using the parallelogram method. Now, another thing that I'm going to probably mention at the end of every one of these videos is the best way to really understand this is through examples. The best way to understand the theory in this course is through actual applications. So if you guys look in the description below, I'm going to have two example videos, one on how to add two vectors together, and then one, of course, to add three vectors together, just to kind of cover everything we learned in this video here. So yeah, that's it for this video, guys. Thank you guys so much for listening. I will see you guys in the next video.